Hey folks, Steve Vai here, and welcome to Under It All, Episode 7. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, what I'm doing here, um, I've decided to do these live streams and uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the lockdown. And Tuesdays uh, live streams are called Alien Guitar Secrets, and that's where I talk about music and the guitar and my career as a musician and all the uh, well, I take questions some of them are questions about me and some of them are questions about you in your career I love answering those questions but this forum here under it all is different okay so a lot of people that may be aware of what I do as a musician might come to something like under it all here and be a little surprised because uh, uh, I guess parallel with my development through life as a musician, I've also been very interested in esoteric principles, spirituality, that kind of thing, and have gleaned uh, some experience from that. And what I do in Under It All here, I approach uh, questions that come in uh, based more on, uh, they're not usually musical questions. So if you're commenting on, you know, play Tender Surrender or something, I'm not playing in this. <laughs> I, I reserve that for the uh, Alien Guitar Secrets. And, uh, and by the way, thank you for the, uh, uh, any, any of you had that, that did attend Tuesday's Alien Guitar Secrets, uh, thank you for all those lovely bad horsey comments. Um, I really enjoyed doing that. I was very apprehensive to do it because uh, you know, playing live, you just never know what's going to come out. And I really hadn't, uh, a song takes its shape after a couple of weeks on tour. I mean, that's when it really, you know, so here in the Harmony Hut, I'm just picking up the guitar and practicing it a few times and then going for it. But uh, that's for Alien Guitar Secrets. Here at Under It All. Uh, so please don't get frustrated if you hear me talking about things that have nothing to do with what you might expect I might be saying. But uh, it's been working out pretty good. I've been seeing a lot of responses, and please keep in mind that anything I discuss in Under It All is really based on my, my perspective of things, and also um, it's based on, uh, I pull from my uh, spiritual studies, and those started back when I was 20, 21. And, uh, you can hear a lot of things coming from me that you might find uh, in the teachings of Eckhart Tolle. He uh, had a huge impact on me. And also the teachings of uh, Krishnamurti, A Course in Miracles is huge for me. Uh, Abraham Hicks, so many, so many. You know, I've, I've scanned some of the great teachings of so many of today's uh, spiritual teachers, so to speak. and. Uh, there is a commonality, and that's what I look for, and that's what I discuss. So let's get started. All right. Got some questions here. Give me one minute. Steve, I've never been a fan of your music, but I have been a fan of the way you perceive the world. Can you be honest and say if the first part of my statement bothers you at all? <laughs> and can you think of any situation where valuing someone else's opinion would be a healthy thing to do? Okay, thanks. Uh, Steve, I've never been a fan of your music, uh, but have been, well, <laughs> uh, my reaction to somebody that tells me they're not a fan of my music has changed through the years. In the beginning, it really didn't matter because I had no fans. And if somebody liked what I was doing, great. If not, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't feel like, I mean, it was nice. Of course, it's nice when somebody resonates with what you're doing, you know. But I did recognize that uh, the stuff that I was doing was an acquired taste, you know, uh, flexible, <laughs> flexible leftovers, you know. And... Uh, but then when, uh, you know, when Passion and Warfare and Dave Roth and, you know, the big rock star thing started to happen, uh, you know, the ego came in the back door and uh, 
a statement like that, I may have, I've never been a fan of your music. It, it may have had a little more of a pull in me to like uh, feel, you know, why don't you like my music? But uh, after decades of being in the music business, 40 years of being somewhat of a public figure, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, the music business is actually a small field in all of the industry of the world. And within the music industry, the field of rock is, uh, takes up a, a relatively small percentage. And then in the field of rock, there's instrumental guitar rock, which takes up a tiny little piece. And then within that, uh, there's all sorts of offshoots of various kinds of stuff. So really, when I say um, being a public figure, it's very narrow. It's very comfortable for me because uh, uh, I, I can live a very normal life. When I go out, you know, it's not like, oh, there's Tom Cruise or, you know, something like that. And it's very comfortable. But... Uh, no, I, I've, uh, it's nicer when somebody says, I like your music, but after 40 years in the business and, and being attacked relentlessly at times in the press, uh, you just grow thick skin. You know, you, you, you just realize that people have their own uh, likes and dislikes, and it's fine. Um, it's nice when somebody resonates with what I do, but I remember, I remember when I, the, the, the first time I met Ingve. Uh, we were young. We, I mean, he was very young. I, I was probably 22. And he comes to me, he goes, Hey, Steve, you know what, man? I think you're a cool guy. I like you. I don't like the way you play guitar, but I like you. <laughs> it's a Swedish honesty. And, uh, and I said to him, Well, Ingve, if I had to choose my friends based on people that just liked my music or the way I play, I may not have very many friends. <laughs> But anyway, uh, so th there's, there it is. Okay, can you be honest and say if the first part of the story bothers you? Not really. It's nicer when you like it, but it's okay that you don't. <laughs> and uh, can you think of any situation where valuing someone else's opinion would be a healthy thing to do? <clears throat> yes, there's many, many situations. Uh, but only you can decide if that opinion that you're receiving is an authentic one and resonates with you, if it feels to you that within that opinion, there's something that goes, hmm, let me see, you know, there's, there, there's a point there, you know, and we do this all the time. I mean, everything that I'm speaking is, a, 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 could be considered an opinion, you know, so you may find some value in some of these things. And that is an opportunity to find uh, some value, a healthy value in somebody's opinion. The unhealthiness comes when somebody, uh, when you are being uh, criticized or if you feel as though you're taking something personally uh, or if somebody is criticizing your music or the kind of clothes you're wearing or the kind of foods you like or the kind of political position you hold or religious position uh, people's opinions can be, they can have edges in them. And those edges are always, those, any edges you, f you feel in somebody's opinion is their fear. <laughs> it's it, when you, if you looked under it, under it all, you'd find that their, 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 the edges in their opinions are fear. And these, uh, uh, it's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having an opinion. What becomes uh, dangerous is when you cherish your opinions and you believe that your opinions are the correct ones, not only for you, but for everybody. This is a form of, of uh, non-confidence because if a person is confident in their opinions, there's no need to have to convince anybody of anything. When you're absolutely confident in your, the things you like, the things you don't like, the, you, you allow the others to have their opinion without it affecting you. You know, you, you, you can allow that and it's not gonna uh, dig you unless of course your ego takes something personally. 
And even benign opinions that can be helpful can be perceived in the other as uh, um, uh, they could take it personally, you know. Uh, and we do that too. I, I can only even say that because I, I do that. You know, I can see when I'm doing that. And that's the only reason, that, that's the only way you can ever come to know somebody else. You have to know yourself. And knowing yourself requires taking the microscope off the world and pointing it in. And we've talked about that. But um, so when you're confronted with somebody's opinion, that opinion can range anywhere between something very simple, like I like red, to the whole world sucks and everybody's an idiot. That's a very, very firm opinion in some people. And there was a time in my life where I was in a situation with people who had that opinion. And I adopted it and it brought intense suffering. So buyer beware. Uh, you know, you, you, when an opinion comes at you, you will know if you can find a space of, of presence, you'll know if it's a healthy opinion that you can gain from or if it's somebody else's insecurities that they're inflicting on you. But only you'll know that. All right. Next question. Watched your episode, episode five and was very interested. I have not read any books about what you spoke of. I have never really liked reading, but I want to learn more and try to help my kids find their way as well. I have three girls and feel as if I'm doing a disservice to them by not giving any perspective or hope and confidence, understanding ourselves and the world we are in. You, to me, sound very intelligent and educated uh, by what you have read and learned, and I want to achieve a similar peace and well-being for both me and my family. So my question is, where do I begin? Research meditation and spirituality or self-help teachings? Sorry if it seems adolescent, but I think I am at my age to an extent by not trying sooner uh, adolescence, but I think I am even at my age to an extent by not trying sooner and with ambition. Thank you for your time and advice. By the way, I love your bro By the way, I love your brother and nephew's restaurant. That's Vise in Chicago. We patronize them often. They are such friendly, warm people, and the food is great too. Uh, Yes, I, I concur. My brother Michael was one of my greatest mentors in life. Uh, we, uh, I'm so fortunate that all of the siblings in my family are very close, you know. Um, okay. Give, give me one moment. All right. Yeah. Uh, it is a very delicate responsibility to raise children. They are like sponges. They're very open and they are constantly learning at all times. And you are constantly teaching them. You're teaching them at all times by your actions, your words, uh, your, your thoughts, because your thoughts create an, a, a vibration in you and they feel that. Children are incredibly uh, intuitional. They're much smarter than we think. As a matter of fact, uh, they come into the world. Well, I don't want to go there yet. But let's just say that they're innocent and they're ready to learn and you're constantly teaching them. So in every conversation that you have, either with them or with somebody else while they're there, they're learning. And as I mentioned uh, before, we're always teaching and we're always learning. You can teach your child anger when you are angry. You, that's what you teach. You can teach them fear, you can teach them insecurities, or you can teach them appreciation, you can teach them love, you can teach them consideration. It's all based on you're doing it. 
you're already doing it. Um, now, when it comes to, okay, but can you be aware that you're doing it? Can, can you be aware that you're, you're teaching your children at all times? Now, when it comes to uh, finding a spiritual path or introducing or uh, a, a religion into the mix, um, you know, all this is fine. Families have uh, different religious uh, cultural uh, practices. Some have, some don't. The cultural practices in a religion vary from religion to religion to religion. And you may be raising your children in a particular religion or spirituality or nothing at all. It doesn't matter because that's not, uh, well, let me, let me put it like, you know, I mean. the religion that a child is raised in can be advantageous to a degree, but it can also be destructive. And that is dependent upon how that religion is practiced. I think for the most part, I, I grew up with a, with a religion that was Catholic. There was nothing forced on me. And I, there was aspects of it I enjoyed very much. There's a, there's a culture, there's ceremonies and rituals that certain religions have that can help a family to find a, a togetherness of sorts, you know, a, a hope. A religion can, can bring people hope when, when in a family. Uh, but then again, you know, religions are, are not the uh, problem. It's the perspective of the religion and, uh, that, that can be, uh, uh, that can send out different messages. So uh, <clears throat> I would suggest that if you are raising your children within a particular religion or spiritual construct or um, that you, you yourself uh, focus on the teachings of that religion and extract from it only the uh, loving, positive aspects of it. Many religions contain f hidden fear that you don't realize that you're engaging in and becoming a prisoner of while you're reading it. Because fear is insidious and insipid. I mean, it's insidious and uh, it, it, uh, it gets its claws in and you don't even realize it. Uh, so can you discern the difference between the fearful aspects of, of the religion that you may be raising your child in or the, uh, <clears throat> the positive aspects of it? And can you shine your light on the positive aspects that I believe would be more beneficial to a child for the rest of their life than focusing on the fearful aspects of it? And uh, okay, well, this is absolutely a personal choice and I would never suggest one way or another, but within your religious teachings to your child, if at any point along the way you were taught, and it's just my perspective, just a little thought, take it for what it is, if you were taught or if that religion believes that it is the only way that's a red flag. Uh, this is a separative, separatist mentality. It separates the rest of the world. And it says, I know and you don't. And this is found in every religion, especially cults. It's not the, it may not be the predominant thought. Because remember, in a religion, there's everything from Gandhi to gangbangers, okay? And if you take something like even uh, Islam or Muslims, you say that word and people, Muslims, Islam, you know? I've studied uh, that a bit and there are very many Muslims that are loving and they're s seeking for the truth and maybe they've found it in their religion. But the truth, truth does not necessarily, you do not need a religion or a spiritual practice or even the knowing of the word spirituality or any of it. You don't need any of it to find out who you are and to find the core teaching of spirituality and religion. It's not privy to one group. This is, the, the thought of that being true is, is a form of insanity. 
And uh, you can see it all the time. That's what war is about. We know you don't. We're right. You're wrong. Now I have to kill you. <laughs> okay. So can you see that if it's happening inside of you? So I don't usually like to use a religion to, f to point at the things that I find in the, from the spiritual studies that I've done because it just gets confusing and people get, take, take things personally and then you're subject to criticism and all this kind of thing when in reality what I'm trying to find is the commonality because the, the commonality is the same. The goal, the goal is the same. The goal for every human being is the same and every human being has a different path. Everyone, even the one sitting next to you in your spiritual practice. The path is different because the perspective of each person is different and they learn differently and they need to learn different things at different times than you. And as they learn on their path, the goal is the same. And that's waking up. That is not, the, the process of waking up is not uh, something for one religion or one spiritual path. It, it, all of that is gone. When you wake up, all of that is gone. All your traditions, you can hold on to them and you can practice them and, and they're fine and they're nice. I, you know, you, I mean, you can practice all the traditions of your religion but it, you know, in a, in a state of being awake, but it may or may not be that the religion did it. It may or may not be that anything, uh, when a person is ready, it happens. And it's uh, many times religions or spiritual paths can be a great hindrance because in the mind of the person, the, it creates an identity. I am a member of this cult or sect or whatever it is. And, you know, this is, this is a block. And even spirituality, it's not uncommon for a person to go through life and then change and then all, I, I know I'm answering a question. This question, it's going to go. It's probably going to be the whole episode. So, <laughs> uh, even a person that's studying spirituality and says, "Whoa, this is much better than my religion. I am going to now follow this spiritual path." It's very easy for the ego to come in the back door, and 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 tell you that you are the spiritual one. You, you are much better than those dirty sinners, or you know the secrets and they don't, you know? Or you, anything that creates a sense of superiority in you is ego, is fear, and will always be a detriment to your peace, your, uh, the purity of your high, the, the, the ability for you to be the most creative, the, the most effective, the most loving, the most um, inspiring person that you can be. Uh, it will always get in the way. Okay, so another thing, uh, so what I would like to maybe talk about here for you are things that do not necessarily require the study of spiritual, spirituality or religion or anything because they're just basic principles that can be very helpful and they are spiritual principles, but I didn't say that word. These are just principles that you can apply. So, so teaching a child, knowing now the delicacy of it, one of the things that you can teach your girls is how to listen. But you have to know what that means. You have to know how to listen yourself first. So, how do you listen? It requires you to enter the state of presence. It requires you, when listening to somebody else, 
to give them your full attention, like your full attention, without waiting for them to stop talking so you can give them your opinion, without critiquing or criticizing them in your own mind, without correcting them in your own mind while they're speaking, without placating them by some reason that you feel you need to placate them for some kind of gain that you are looking for. Um, so that requires a state of open listening. And that also in this state, what you are doing is you are accepting the other to have their perspective. You are allowing them and you are listening. Now, the only way to really ever be an effective conversationalist and actually have a meaningful uh, relationship with somebody, and this is, can be tricky to do, at some point you have to figure out how to see things through their perspective. You have to be able to listen and understand what they're saying and try to imagine how they must feel about their perspective. It doesn't mean that you need to agree with their perspective. It may be in complete opposition to your uh, MO, you know, but you will not be able to be a, an effective helper or teacher or learner or conversationalist unless you can see from the other person's perspective. Because it's very important to understand that when somebody's talking to you and giving their opinion or perspective, they believe they are correct. They absolutely believe that they are correct. And they might be about certain things, you know. Um, so in order to teach your child how to listen, you have to be able to do it. And that is the greatest gift you can give your child because it gives them a sense of belonging. It gives them a sense of self-worth that they are being heard. And it gives them the feeling of appreciation. Because when you can, and that, that, that holds true for anybody that you're having a conversation with and you're being present. And even then, your opinions, if, you, if they are different, when they come out of you in a state of presence, they're not damning. They, they, they don't have edges. Remember the edges I was saying? And it's, they're not there because you don't, you don't need to cherish your opinion. And also, it's just your opinion. So listening is a powerful tool that many people just don't know how to do. But it's the greatest gift that you can give somebody because it tells them you accept them for exactly what and who they are wherever they're at right now. So, and as I say, you can only teach, teach your children how to listen when you know how to do it and you do it with them and you, you show it in front of them with others every time they're there. And if that can become a habit in you, the rest of your life will be very beautiful and easy. <laughs> Even the challenges. Even the hard stuff gets easier. Okay, what else? I think it's very, very important to empower your children. Now, this is a tough one. Uh, you yourself have to trust in their inner guidance. Every child, every person, they have a form of inner guidance. It's important to point out to your child that they have guidance. They have better judgment within them. They have the ability to trust their instincts. Their instincts are, you, you can explain to them that their instincts are deeper than the way they feel, you know, because if they're feeling bad, they're not gonna have access to that instinct, but that they have guidance and that you trust their guidance. This is very empowering for a child because most children feel that their guidance is being compromised based on the parents um, or the world's um, perspective of things. And then they feel that their guidance is not honored and they, they can lose it 
they, they, they don't lose it, it just gets obscured. They don't trust their guidance because they're being confused, but they have it. Children have better guidance, better connection to their guidance than adults because they're less conditioned. They haven't gone through the massive conditioning that the world offers yet, and you can protect them and show them what conditioning is. Uh, but they need to know that they have the tools within them already for the rest of their life. They cannot separate themselves from their guidance. And if you're a, a member of a religious family, you may give a name to that guidance. You might call it, the, 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 it's your Buddha nature that's talking to you. The, the terminology means nothing. It's the same in everybody. Whatever words you give it and however many people you want to kill because they don't call it the same thing is not going to change it. It's in everybody. Nobody is exempt from having guidance. <laughs> Where does this stuff come from? Okay, so um, you can give this guidance various names based on a particular religious practice you may be teaching and that those words could be higher self, better judgment, instinctual intuition, the whole, your Holy Spirit, Jesus, uh, what, what, it doesn't matter, you know, it's there and it is always guiding them. It's important for them to know that they have access to this when they are able to listen and, and know, they know, just like you know. Unless, you're, unless a person is in a state of unconsciousness. And when I say unconsciousness, I'm not referring to the, I'm unconscious, you know. I'm talking about being so absolutely bamboozled by the thoughts in your mind that you have no access to, uh, to any kind of center. You know, you don't, you don't have any emotional equilibrium. And it's also very important to know that whatever state you are in, that's what, that's the, the, that is the extent of the access that you will have in expressing any ideas to anybody else, especially your children. That's why the question, how do I feel right now, is so important. Because unless you are in a state of of being centered in your natural state, your higher uh, uh, resonating state of being, you know, your, your true self, say to, so to speak, uh, you can't teach, you can't teach it. You, 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 you cannot teach what you don't have. And by finding that place, by asking yourself, how do I feel now, and using some of the techniques we talked about in that episode, to get to that place for you, then that's a good time to, to talk to your children about any of this stuff. This is why it's more important how you feel than, than your family even. Of, of course, what that doesn't mean, you, you, I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Uh, of course, your family is important. <laughs> but the way you feel in regard to what you teach is more important because you can't teach them something you don't have. So leading a child to know, not believe, to know that they have guidance and that they can trust that guidance. And obviously there's things that a parent needs to teach and take control of and, and be disciplined at, you know, don't run in the road or whatever. Uh, but even the way that you explain those things that a parent needs to teach a child for their own safety, that in and of itself has long lasting effects. Because if you say, don't go near honeybees. If you get near a bee, you know what happens if you get stung? Do you know what's gonna happen? You could die. You could die. That's just one small example of teaching fear. There's many other ways to teach. Be careful of honeybees. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So how are you even teaching those things that are your responsibility to teach? When the child goes to go in the road, you're obviously going to stop them. How do you teach them that? You know, uh, do you yell and scream based on your own fear, which comes from your own fear? 
Um, and this, this is traumatizing. This is conditioning. You are conditioning your child with fear when you react to them, even in the natural ways that you need to teach your children what to do, what not to do. You, 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 you would be surprised how, and, and, and many times it's with all good intentions. Of course you have good intentions when you're teaching your child. That's built into you. But how those attentions, intentions are expressed are absolutely joined at the hip with your clarity and conscious, your, the level of your emotional equilibrium. Knowing that they have guidance for the rest of their life is one of the greatest gifts you can give them because then they start trusting in their instincts. It's also important to uh, perhaps to perhaps, te perhaps teach your child how to get in touch with the way they feel. Teaching them to ask themselves that question, how do I feel right now? You know, and as that question was expressed in one of the under it alls, the important thing to get to what that question really means, it is necessary to exclude all outside influences. Because the moment you say, how, how do I feel? The mind is going to go, I feel like this because of that. And it's going to point to the outside world and find excuses or blame for the reason why you feel a certain way. Or even, or even it might find um, the reasons why you feel so good. I feel really good because of that, that, and that. I just, just got a, a, an advance. I just got a raise. You know, things are looking good. I feel good because of that. This exercise goes deeper. It's requiring you to put your full attention on a the actual feeling because the feeling of how you feel is the most direct experience that you can have. The outside world is it's not even a part of you. It can't even be, it, it looks as though the outside world is doing it to you, but it's just not. And that's important to understand that you are 100% responsible for the way you feel. What, no, ex, no, ex, no exception, no exception. It, it, you are in charge of the choices of thoughts you have. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if I'm not feeling good, there's something wrong with me. I mean, there's situations you, you, you can only know from one situation to another. But it's the feeling itself. If you were to put a word, a one, one word on the way you feel, content, I feel content. No, no reason. That's the feeling. Or I feel frustrated. The feeling of frustration is in me. Okay, that's a recognition of the way you feel. I feel guilty. I feel aroused. I feel, I feel high on life. I feel really good. I feel freedom. I feel cl clarity. Uh, I feel I feel enthusiasm. I feel joy. You know, the, this is the, it, no need for the outside world because well, I'm asking you to find the direct, the most direct, and the most direct thing about the way you feel is the feeling itself, excluding anything on the outside world. Because I let you in on a secret. What you perceive in the outside world is a reflection of how you feel no exceptions and the 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 way that you feel there's very many different feelings in you that you may not even be aware of there's thought patterns that are buried and there's perspectives of the world that you have that you may uh that may pop up when you look at something like a red car you know uh, that means something different to you than anybody else but that red car is actually manifested or you were attracted to it, not because there was happened to be a red car there, but that was a vibration in you. Maybe it was the, 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 the joy of the red car you got when you were 17 years old, or maybe it was the fear that a red car generates in you because that was the one that your friend was killed in. Whatever it is, you know, that's, it's not out there, it's in here. 
So when you get in touch with that feeling, then you have an opportunity to change it. But only when you realize that it's an inside job can you change it. So, so teaching a child how to be in touch with their feelings can be very beneficial for them. Can you point out to them what it feels like in them when they're taking something personally? Because this is a big a problem for a lot of people in life. People take certain things personally that are just ridiculous, you know? So, but being able to point out to them when, because they may come to you with a problem, they do all the time, you know, Jimmy beat me up, you know, or whatever. And they, 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 all the other kids were making fun of my shoes. <laughs> that actually, that happened to me when I, I was in third grade. I was the first one to go to school with bell bottoms and high heels. <laughs> High, you know, high heel 70s clogs. And uh, boy, did I get beat up for it. Not physically, mentally. And uh, I took it very personally. So can you teach your child to see when they have to be in touch with the way they feel in order to circumnavigate the feeling of taking something personally? Can you... See, can you teach your child to be able to recognize fear, uh, uh, frustration in them? The moment that they're able to recognize it, I see that I'm frustrated. That feeling I have is frustration. It's difficult if it's rage or anger. If all bets are off, you're not going to get through. You're just not going to get through if somebody's in a state of panic or f deep fear or intense anger and rage. Don't, don't think that any of you, uh, unless you're a, some kind of a master, uh, uh, which I'm not, <laughs> I don't claim, uh, you will not have access to really helping that person. They, they, that has to run its course. Their anger, their freakdom, their freaking out just needs to run its course. But the more that a child is able to recognize in themselves these feelings by you pointing them out, which would require you to be able to point them out in yourself from an unbiased perspective first, <laughs> uh, then you can teach it to your child and it'll be very valuable because they won't, they won't buy into it so much. And when you, can you point out fear in a, when, a, when a child is experiencing fear? When they, are, when they can see that they're doing this, then you can explain to them that the reason they are feeling this is because of the thoughts that they're thinking about it. And if they don't understand that, which I'm, I'm sure they will, they're much smarter. You know, they usually don't come back and say, yeah, but what if, you know. Uh, so then you can help them to choose better thoughts. And you can do it very, um, uh, you could do it so they don't even know it. You just do it. You say, well, well, why do you think Jimmy is making fun of your shoes, you know? Um, is it something that really is about you or is it about him, you know? And can you allow him to have that f opinion without it affecting you? Say, so, okay, you don't like my shoes, that's fine. I like them, I like my shoes. That's, that's independence. Teaching your child that it is okay to like what they like and that's very difficult for parents because most parents believe that the child has to like what they like. <laughs> they don't respect, it's hard to respect a child's intuitive likes and dislikes because many parents see children as just, they don't have that guidance. They don't know those things. You have to teach them those things. Uh, but um, I beg to differ. You know, they know. Everybody comes into the world with their own set of cards. And uh, so teaching your child to choose better thoughts about things is, is a very powerful practice. It doesn't require a book. It doesn't require a religion or it, it is a spiritual, um, uh, it's something that comes with it. It comes in the higher degrees of religions. It's choosing better thoughts. Uh, Another great thing to teach your child is to fo you foster in them their creativity.
Okay. Every person has a creative impulse, and that creative impulse is unique to them. And it is focused on the right thing for them, and you, and you, and you know when you're doing it, because when you're doing it, you just feel good. While you're doing the simple thing that is your most effective creative work, you are feeling, you are feeling enthusiasm, you are, there's no fear, there's no future, you're not, you're not contemplating what this means to you in the future. There's only the present moment and the creative impulse that's coming through you in a joyous way. And this is uh, very covered up in many people because they, the ego will tell them that this simple little thing that they do, that they really love, that is effective when they do it and brings them peace and joy and they're really good at it and uh, there's no fear in it, there's no expectation in it, um, the ego will say it's not good enough. It's not good enough for you because how are you going to make a living at this? How are you going to show that you're better than everybody else at this? How, are you, how is this going to make you better than everybody or the best, the best of? Okay, so this introduces into your mind confusion and fear. So fostering a child's true creative potential requires you to be able to identify that true creative potential in the child and the child will not even have great access to it if the environment they are living in is not allowing it. <laughs> so it requires you to be very vigilant in the observation of your children's interests and then discussing it, those interests with them in a state of presence. If your child is doing art, you know, and, and they're doing homework and they're just rushing through it half-ass, not even finishing it, so they can go and do art. Or they can go and do cooking, or they can go and uh, whatever it is that they find that is that doesn't require you to say, now you have to do this, you know. So can you help them unfold that interest by by letting them know the truth that that interest in and of itself is wor they are worthy of having that interest and they are worthy of exploring it and 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 cultivating it and manifesting it into anything they want if if a child I'm just using a, an example if you notice that you, your child likes to uh, sew If that like is what like really turns them on, like that's where they find their joy, is it possible to cultivate that in them? There's obviously many ways to make a living, a good, a decent living, sewing. You don't have to necessarily think my son is a sew, he, he loves, or my daughter loves sewing, so she has to own her own company, you know, and she has that. That you you can't foster any of that. That is based on the desires of the individual. And no amount of beating them over the head to be uh, wildly successful at what they do is going to help. As a matter of fact, it, it causes confusion in them because it leads them to believe that if they don't, then they are a failure. And then this creates the fear of failing. And this colors and uh, their creative uh, enjoyment. So... Uh, fostering the creativity in a person, in the child, is, is very valuable. Letting them know that their creativity is just fine, whatever is interesting to them. And then when you show interest in those things that are interesting to them, they'll be your best friend for life, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, Okay, I'm going to talk about judgment. Because judgment is something uh, that uh, we do, and it's something we teach, and we teach our children. But the kind of judgment I'm going to discuss here, there's, I'm going to dis there's two kinds. Usually there's two kinds of everything. <laughs> 
There's the pseudo and then the real. So the first kind of judgment I'd like to discuss is the judgment that the world knows. And this judgment that uh, we believe uh, is, is what judgment is, um, it has condemnation in it. It uh, has fear in it. It, it has an agenda in it. Uh, it's important to understand that you can't judge anything. Not that you shouldn't. I, I've talked about this before. You can't because the, the evidence of this is in the simple fact that if you look into your past, there are things that has happened to you in your life that you judged a particular way at one point in your life and then changed your mind about and then maybe changed your mind again. That means that your judgment is flawed completely because if you change your judgment, it was never really truth. It was just a judgment. <laughs> uh, in order to actually judge an event as being good or bad, that, that's an illusion created in the mind of man, uh, that they can judge something as being good or bad. Okay, I, We do it, and it's fine. Uh, yes, obviously, there's things you know, this is, this is good, this is not a good thing to do, this is okay. But this, the judgment I'm talking about that the world knows is different. Um, uh, it's, uh, in order to be able to judge anything, you would have to know all of the components that brought, back, uh, that brought about the event itself and how all of those components, first of all, in order to know those components, you'd have to go back trillions of years, <laughs> you know. But in any events, at some point in time, something happened where it created an event. This is happening all the time in your now. Uh, and when that event happened, in order to judge that, you would have to be able to judge all of the effects that all of the components had that brought about that event and how those how those causes affected everybody involved which is everybody and then you'd have to determine you'd have to know how th that event is affecting actually affecting the people that are involved in it maybe it's you and how that event is affecting them and, and, and how, that effect, how that effect will reach into their world and affect others, you'd have to know that in order to say, well, that event was, a, was bad <laughs> or that was good. So you don't know these things. Nobody does. Uh, and you'd also have to be able to know how that event will affect all the people and the other events that come after it. And you'd have to be able to judge all of those. Uh, nobody has this ability while they are seeing the world through the eyes of fear. There is something in you, though, that does know. It does know all of the events the quality of those events, the whys, how that event is affecting everybody now, and how that ev event is going to affect you and everything else in the future. And that thing in you that does know this is your higher self. It's your guidance. It's your intuitive impulses. It may not explain these things to you because none of the external events actually matter. So teaching a child that judgment, the difference between judging somebody or an event, the difference between that and having your own personal opinion about it. <clears throat> okay, uh, another thing I could discuss, I guess this is a long one, <laughs> uh,
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the most important thing in the world. <laughs> How pretentious of me, right? Well, you t you tell me after I finish if it how how valuable it might be to understand and what that is is forgiveness forgiveness in reality is the only thing of any real value in this world because from it comes everything but like everything there's two levels of what forgiveness is there's the worldly understanding and perspective of what forgiveness is. And then there's a deeper understanding of what true forgiveness is. So I'm going to do my best. There are really many great sources. I highly recommend, if this is interesting to you, to check out those ones. Much of what I'm saying now is from A Course in Miracles. Worldly forgiveness has an agenda in it. It lords over others and it holds people as ransom. I forgive you, but don't you forget it. Now, of course, in the world, there's many different layers of forgiveness. Way, you know, there can be forgiveness. But for the most part, there's an agenda in it. There's a quid quo pro with your forgiveness. Uh, may, maybe not you all the time, but I, this is just the way I'm expressing it. I know with me, I've seen this in myself. That's the only way that I can talk about it. When you are forgiving somebody because they've wronged you, First of all, you believe that they wronged you somehow, which is another illusion, but I don't want to get into that. So when you forgive them, what you're saying is, I am the great one here. I am the better one. I am the higher one because I am forgiving you. But don't you forget it because I'm going to be calling on you when you do something. That, and, and also, I will remind you that I forgave you and that you owe me, and I will call on you when I need that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yes, uh, there's an agenda in the world's forgiveness. Now, what is true forgiveness? True forgiveness in its deepest sense is the realization that there's nothing to forgive. Okay. Um, when somebody does something that offends you, that you believe requires your forgiveness, it's very important to understand that everybody, everybody, is at a particular level of conscious development at any given time in their life. You are what you is right now. Now, who you are right now, I'm talking about the, even the egoic self, the, the, the image of the self that you have, that has uh, within it uh, certain structures of understandings. And it has certain, uh, certain ignorances in it. It has certain uneducated understandings. This is very obvious to see in yourself when you look back at when you were 12 years old, the things that you knew and the things you didn't know, and then the things you knew and didn't know when you were 13, and then when you were 50. Uh, you know, throughout your whole life, you are learning and you are expanding your awareness. You cannot go back, by the way. There's no such thing as going back. You are always moving forward and you're always improving the quality of your awareness, even though it may not look like that on the outside, or even to yourself on the inside. 
but it, you are always in a state of improving. And life will bring you the opportunities to improve your weaknesses. So for instance, if a person is in great fear of financial uh, ruin, then they are, that, that is a particular stage, at, and then maybe they will experience financial ruin or some other kind of loss. And in that, they're, they're living out their greatest fear and they're realizing that I'm, I'm getting back on my feet and maybe even their finances at another time might be greater. Or maybe they've discovered they don't need all that. They didn't know that then because they were in fear. But later on, they had a better understanding. So everybody is, can only, and this is great, check out Eckhart's teachings on this. Nobody can act outside of their conditioning. Nobody can be different, can, can have access to doing things that are not in their wheelhouse. So when you look at somebody, when you look at something that somebody did, let's say, let's say you're looking at something in the past, and you, when you say, why did you do that? Well, the answer is easy. That's all they knew to do. That's all they could do. That's all that their emotional tools allowed them to do. The choice they made was the only choice they could have made at that time. They, 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 they had no choice in a sense until they realized they had a choice. But then you may say something like, you should have known better. <laughs> How? If they didn't know, it's obvious they didn't know better. So if they didn't know better, do you hear how ridiculous it sounds for you to say you should have known better? Maybe they heard something that could have been perceived as an idea that they could have acted on where a better result would have happened, but they weren't ready to do that. This is just obvious. They, 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 so to hold somebody responsible for their own ignorance is a judgment. And it's also a blame, and it's also a form of your own uh, unconsciousness and a, and a, an insanity. Because by telling somebody why did you why didn't you do this, it's kind of like saying to them, "Don't be short. Why are you gay? What? Why are you? Why are you uh, black or white or you know you shouldn't be." It doesn't make any sense, right? Similarly, to tell somebody, you should know better, you should have been able to act out of everything that you've learned in the past to be able to make a decision that was better for me or for everybody or for yourself. No, they don't have the tools, but life will give them the tools because although it looks like they're not responsible even for the decisions they make, they will suffer the consequences. That's, uh, that's uh, inescapable. And that will be their learning tool so that the next time a particular situation comes into their life, they have more of those tools to act from and the decision may be different. Now, it won't be different until they learn and as a result, they will continue to attract, you will continue to attract situations in your life that are painful uh, based on your uh, own thought patterns about things. That's karma. Uh, that's what karma is. It's just the external manifestation of repetitive thought patterns. And you believe that it keeps happening to you in the outside world, but it's the inside that needs to change in order for the outside. So forgiveness, when seen in this light, is very easy because there's nothing to forgive. A person can only act out, they only have access to the thoughts which, are, which will create the words and the actions. Thought always comes first. They only have access to what their experience has given them up to that point. So forgiving is easy. 
because it, what it what it says is there's nothing to forgive. Now, of course, you can you can teach through your example uh, to help them to uh, understand a higher level of uh, a perspective about those things that they're unaware of, and then it's obviously up to them to take uh, take them into account and see the value of it in their own life. But uh, this kind of forgiveness is real forgiveness. And what it does when you do it, you're letting yourself off the hook. That's, that's why it's the most important thing. You are, what you are doing when you are letting go, when you are forgiving in the way that I'm uh, uh, suggesting is you are, um, you are freeing yourself from fear. Yeah. Yeah. And when you free yourself from fear, the world you see just changes everything about it. And that's your, your main function in life is to forgive the world. Forgive the world its insanities because it just does not know better, but it's learning. In, the forgi in your forgiveness of the world, you're, you are letting yourself off the hook for all of the suffering that you are inflicting on yourself. And more importantly, or just, just as important, you are releasing the other. Just, I mean, just look at it. When, you, when you, somebody comes to you and says, I took your car without asking, uh, I ran it into a pole. Uh, it's destroyed. The tow trucks had to come. I don't even have the money for it. I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, you can, you can get pretty upset at something like that. But can you see that, and you can say, how could you do that? How, don't you know that that's my car? Where's your sense of, you know, uh, why, why would you take my car without asking? Why would you, you know, and then how did you get into an accident, you know, and what are you going to do for my car? Okay, th th this is, uh, what it's saying is, you should have known better. But they didn't. The evidence of that is in the fact that they took your car. <laughs> so, you have to understand, they didn't know that. They, did, they didn't have the tools. You believe they should have. Right now, you're sitting there saying, no, 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 they should have known. But they didn't. And neither do you on many subjects that you're confronted with every day, that you're acting out, but you're learning from. Can you see this happening in your life? You will the moment you forgive. And when you forgive the world, you're releasing the world <laughs> from its insanity. And then the world you see will change. It must. Because when you release fear from yourself, the world you see is different. It's a beautiful world. It's, it's the real world. It's the world that you were, came here to be a part of. And it's here right now. It's not something that's not here. It's here. It's surrounding you right now. <laughs> okay, I've, I've gone down that rabbit hole. All right. You know, forgiveness, um, uh, please research what true forgiveness is. It's of the greatest value. People associate, some, some people associate, uh, you know, God as f f uh, forgiving. Uh, God does not forgive because God does not condemn. God does not know forgiveness because he doesn't condemn. Condemnation is a human concept brought on by the separated mind and produced by fear. <laughs> and uh, if you can understand that and teach that to your child, you're giving them a really good leg up in life. Because along with that comes compassion, true compassion. When you learn how to forgive, 
entirely based on the the real real forgiveness you're waking up that that's in in christian terminology that's that's what i call the atonement it's not what i call it it's one way of looking at what the atone what what, what it means to atone and of course there's there's many other things that we can teach a child through our actions such as uh appreciation but even appreciation has various levels to it and there's the worldly understanding of appreciation and it may sound something like this i really appreciate uh, these things that i have because they they serve me really well and i appreciate the fact that you know i have a pencil and that i can write and i appreciate the fact that i have a roof over my head and that I have food to eat and that I have air to breathe and I have the sunshine that and I, I appreciate the fact that the entire solar system is in perfect balance and <laughs> you know whatever it is that you are appreciating um, and this is this is this is a, a I think it's a, a wonderful thing uh, but there's a deeper form of appreciation that penetrates much more effectively and if you can find it you can teach it. And what that consists of, it's not necessarily mental lip service where you look at something and you're telling yourself, I appreciate this because I can benefit from this in various ways. Okay, so sometimes people believe that in order to appreciate something, they have to think about it in their head and say the words in their mind, I appreciate this, I appreciate this. It can work sometimes, but most of the time it doesn't because in the background, it's not deep enough. There's something, there's another voice congesting the real appreciation. So, in order to know real appreciation, like I was mentioning, how do I feel? And taking away the externals, can you find the feeling of appreciation in you? The feeling without necessarily having to point it at something. This is, will transform your entire life, by the way. Okay, so can you find the feeling of appreciation? Now here's how you can find appreciation in the world. You give it your full attention, your full mindful present attention, without any mental lip service. If you can look at something in a state of intense presence, it will change. Not, it's not going to change its form. It's not going to turn from a camera to a box of cards, you know. The way you perceive it is going to change. When you're not labeling it, when you're not judging it or giving it a meaning. If you can take any meaning that you give things away, if you can put it aside and just look at it, you will notice miraculous things starting to happen if you can hold that presence and this is what I work on I'm I am not I do not live in this state all the time I am a work in progress I'm sharing these things because I've touched them and they have had deep uh, impacts on me and for whatever it's worth here I am given <laughs> you know talking about it um, but I have absolutely, I can tell you, have experienced those changes in the things I see. And what changes, you notice that things are alive. There's a, there, everything is alive. In the, in, in the limited human perspective, we designate life to things that are animate, like a bug, a tree, a human, that's alive. But in our higher state of awareness, we see everything as alive. It's just a different form of being alive. And the way that you can see this is to shut off the, th the, the thinking mind as best you can for a moment and be present. Be in this very moment looking at something. What, what you can start to notice, that it's alive, there's, a, there's, a, there's an alive, 
a, it has a personality. I can't explain it. Uh, it, it has a, a personality and it's a charming one. <laughs> There's a delight. There's a delightful personality in anything you give your attention to without thinking about it, without judging it, without criticizing it, without labeling it, without believing you know what it is, without any belief at all. <laughs> and you can find those moments. They go like this. This is your mind. Blah, 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 blah. You can even show your kids this. Your mind is thinking all these thoughts, all these thoughts, and then you pop out. Thought, thoughts come in, you see them in the background, they, they grab you. Thoughts have an incredible pull, especially the ones that uh, are fearful. Whenever you practice presence, if you've gotten past the fear, you've, uh, you can notice that the mind is in incredible power. The, the, the momentum of thoughts, the momentum of thinking uh, has incredible power to it. And it will tell you things like, no time for presence now. No, you have to worry about this. You have to figure this out. Because if you don't figure out what's going to happen tomorrow or in one minute from now or next year or when you're 60 or when you're 80, then you're just in trouble. You know, you, if, you can't fi if you don't figure it out, you're in trouble. And that's the trap. That's the human condition. And it's an illusion. It's an illusion created by the human mind. Not the human mind. The... Um, and terminologies, I'm sure there's people saying, no, he's using the word mind wrong or whatever. I, this is just my terminology. Uh, it, it's, the, it's an illusion of the egoic perspective in humans that is crumbling away slowly. You can't teach this to your children until you can do it yourself. They may already be doing it, as a matter of fact, Children are much more able to be present than adults. They're much more, a they have better access to their imagination, their creative imagination than adults. Well, in some cases, uh, because many adults become very conditioned through life. Uh, okay. Other things that might be very helpful to teach your child that are not necessarily joined uh, at the hip with various religious terminologies or even spiritual terminologies, but do exist in these things, uh, is things like charity. Charity is a very powerful, uh, empathetical, if there, isn't, if there is even such a word, um, thing to do. Now, and of course, charity, like all the others, have di has different levels. The world's idea of charity, I mean, the ego's idea of charity is to give so it can receive somehow. It, it, so so it, it can have uh, an agenda. I will give you if I get this. And w when I talk about that kind of charity, you may see it in yourself. I've seen it in myself. I still see remnants of it because there's a you know, it, it's, it's the idea of, I will give so I can get a tax deduction. I will give so everybody knows how generous I am. I will give because uh, whatever reason has an agenda in it, your charity is, um, is flawed. <laughs> and that's not, the, not necessarily the healthiest charity that you can uh, teach a child. But you have to understand what the deeper charity is. And some pointers I might give to what that is. It's the, you don't even have to give physical things. Money, time. Of course, those things are nice and they have their place. But your most powerful charitable contribution that you can give to anybody is your appreciation. Uh, it, 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 you could just think of that situation and give it your blessing. Give it your, your, you give it your blessing. You bless that person in your mind. And that's more powerful. Uh, of course, giving is good. 
But when you well, forgiveness is one of the one of the greatest charitable donations you can make, true forgiveness. And it's interesting in the course, uh, it's, it states that forgiveness is, ver is basically only good in, in, to up to a point. And then it doesn't exist in heaven. It doesn't exist in the present moment. There is nothing to forgive. So what else? There's uh, empathy. Empathy is a lovely thing to teach a child. But it has edges if not approached carefully. Most often the world's idea of empathy means to means that you you will suffer with them you need to bring yourself to a point where you understand how they feel and in order to do that you have to show them that you are suffering with them that you understand their suffering this is basically i i might a, from my perspective, is the world's form of empathy. I feel so bad for you. You lost this one example. You lost your job because of that guy. Yeah, he was an idiot. He shouldn't have done that to you. He just, he shouldn't have done that. You have every right to be upset, and I understand. That's not being, that's not showing empathy. That's incredibly destructive to do. We don't know that it is. But what you're saying when you're doing that is, first of all, you have an agenda. And what it's saying is, I agree with you. Accept me. Accept me as your friend so that we can have, as the Course calls it, a special relationship. <laughs> uh, this is all ego. And it is not the most effective form of empathy at all. It's agreeing with the other person's sense of suffering. How can you help somebody when you are agreeing that they are correct to suffer because they lost their job and their boss was an asshole, is an asshole, whatever. Uh, you can't. You will only infuriate their sense of uh, egoic position or you will only strengthen it. You will strengthen it and you're not helping them. So what is real empathy? It's the showing of the person their own strength. It's the explaining to the person that they do not need to suffer the way they are suffering and that they have within them, that, that the, obst the obstacles that they are confronted with are the thoughts in their mind about a situation. So another approach might be, you lost your job. Okay, well, what does that mean? You don't really know what that means. You know, we don't, we don't know what that means. It could mean that it's time for a change. Obviously, that it means that. You cannot deny that it's time. Only, only the ego will judge and say, no, it wasn't time for a change. Everything was good. You know, you don't know. You don't know anything. You cannot judge. Any, you can't. See, it's a, you, you, you believe you can. The ego believes it can judge everything. And if it's, if, it, if it's wrong, it will figure out ways to prove that it's right. <laughs> but when, but, but in, in, in empathy, so well, you don't, you don't know why you lost your job. It could be that there's, there's something much better ahead. And you, ha you don't need to wallow in this. And your boss has his own problems. You know, are, are you going to allow that, your, your boss's opinions and his, his anger, his fears to affect the way you feel? Then you're a slave. Then you're a prisoner. Then you don't know your own power. Then you are subject to depression, guilt, fear, all of these things. Okay? That's not empathy. True empathy points out the strengths. It points out the real power that you have in overcoming things. Okay? It doesn't wallow in the guilt or the fear or the righteousness. But you have to know that to teach that to your children. What else? Parenting by Steve Vai. <laughs> you know, oddly enough, I didn't know any of these things when my kids were, when, when our boys were young. I didn't understand any of this stuff. I think I was probably an okay dad, but 
I was an absentee father in the sense that even when I was there, I wasn't there. And even when I was there, I wasn't there. I mean, not all the time, of course. We had many great, I mean, I was home and that, but I didn't understand any of this stuff. And I couldn't teach it. I do my best to teach it now through example and many, many situations with my kids, I've been able to impart certain things that I've learned when I was learning them and recognizing them in myself because I knew if it's in me, it's quite likely it's in others. One of the very valuable things to teach your child, I believe, is to find, or I should say, they need to learn how to own and operate the word no. That's a Frank Zappa quote, by the way. <laughs> it's a good one, too. Uh, he just blurted that out at the kitchen table one day. Uh, you have to learn to own and operate the, the word no. And Eckhart Tolle calls it your high quality no. And what is your high quality no? I, I believe many of you understand what that means. It's a no that has no exception in it uh, based on fear. Uh, it's a no that is firm. It's like uh, if, a, if, a, if you're approached by something, a situation, and your instincts tell you this is not right for you, you have access to your high quality no. And it just sounds like a high quality no does not have any yelling in it. It doesn't have any aggression in it. It is completely confident in and of itself. It does not need any support from anybody or anything. It uh, is autonomous to you. And it is a very uh, high state of knowing. And it just sounds as simple as And you can see when you're exercising your high quality no and when you're compromising it. You compromise your high quality no when you allow yourself to be bamboozled into things that are of no real great value to you and, and usually detrimental. Oh, I just noted, I th notice I think I'm a little blurry. Give me one second. Maybe I can. Like my face? That better? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so your high quality no. Yes, so this is very valuable for a child to know because children are in very many different situations where they may be um, uh, encouraged to do something that goes against their guidance. And that's when they need to learn to employ their high quality no. They uh, th their high quality no does not engage in something that does not feel good to them. And they need to know that they are allowed to have their high quality no, and, this, and, and they are allowed to use it. When something comes on their experience, something comes into their life that does not feel right to them. And uh, m many, many children, as we know, um, un uh, go through various situations with abuse. Uh, sexual abuse is not very uncommon. And um, many people have had uh, uh, sexual experiences uh, under the age of 18 and as children. And the most detrimental thing, and, and of course there's all sorts, there's all sorts of kinds of situations. There's, there's simple ones that really don't, uh, uh, need to be to have any effect they're inconsequential to absolute violent insane you know where I'm going with that okay I don't even like saying it <laughs> so the most detrimental thing to a child when when after maybe they've experienced something like that is the world's perspective of it because that's the thing that teaches them 
that what happened to them was bad, was wrong, and that there must be something wrong with them. And this, is, this affects them for the rest of their life. It's a conditioning. And it's done wildly around the whole world. Maybe not. Maybe there's some... Huh, anyway. But in any event... If a child knows where their instincts lie and they know that they have access to their high quality no, uh, this will be great guidance for them, for their life. And also their high quality yes, you know? That's when they know something is good for them, something is right, their instincts will know it. <clears throat> okay. What else about this? I've been going on pretty long about this one question, but I think I'm covering a lot of things. Uh, all right. It's funny, I, <laughs> some years ago, I was left with the unduly task of having to tell two seven-year-old girls how a baby was born. <laughs> and I don't know anything about little girls, you know, and anything, but they were children. And I didn't want to cross any lines, so. And that might be something that uh, you, a parent, I, I was never told by my parents, you know, these are things that you're left to figure out on your own a lot of times. But I thought, how would I approach that? You know, how do you approach something like that? And it went like this. Well, there's a lot of things that we do. Now, I may be sounding like I'm talking to a seven-year-old, but, you know. Well, there's a lot of things about the way a baby is born that we do know, and there's a lot of things we don't know. And I can tell you um, the things that I believe we know and the things we really don't know. But usually a baby starts with a man and a woman who enter into what I will call a sacred relationship. And there's many wonderful things that happen in that sacred relationship. That relationship that you have with your partner is the most important relationship you can have for the rest of your life. It's, it, there's a sacredness in it. You share many things. You share your food. You share your laughing. You share your sleeping. You share uh, your sad times. You share everything in that sacred relationship. And there's things about the sacred relationship that you share that you will learn more of when you get older. That you can only learn when you get older. Um, but some of the things that can happen when two people enter a sacred relationship is a baby. A baby. And where the baby comes from, you know, it comes from the mom. And inside the mommy, it's not really her tummy. I'm trying to remember. It was, it's not really her tummy, it's called the womb. And then I think it was like, and it, isn't that a great word, womb, womb? I like even saying it. So this is talking to a seven-year-old, it's nice to, you know, and that womb is very sacred too. And what happens in that womb through the sacred relationship, a little baby starts to form. And it's just tiny, tiny. And this is the human aspect of a baby. And while the mommy grows, that baby is getting all of its nutrients and food. While the baby grows, it's getting all of its nutrients and its food from its mommy. And it's safe and it's secure. But then something happens that we don't know very much about. And what that is, is the other part of who you are, which is the, the human and then the being. There's the being part of you, which is actually who you really are. And that being enters into that baby. Now, what is that being? Well, I would explain it like this. Let's say you have, I'm going to use an, ana I remember, I remember, I was, uh, uh, do you know what the word analogy means? <laughs> and and it, it, kids are much smarter than you think. Uh, I said, 
God, which you'll have to discover when you get older, which is everything, which is all that is, which is love itself. God is love itself. Picture God, now I'm using an analogy, like the sun. And there's a little, there's, the sun has rays, right? The sun rays come down and they shine on things. Now the little sun ray may not know that it came from the sun and that its roots are the sun and that it's a little ray. But what happens, God shines his little ray of sunlight into the human, the baby. And what that ray is, is never not connected to God. It is God. It's your connection. It's who you really are. And you cannot never, you'll never separate yourself from it. It'll never be outside of you. It's who you are. And it shines itself in there. And when it actually shines itself into the baby, we don't know. We don't know when that is, when the life enters the human, when the being enters the human. When is that? We don't know. Uh, my best guess on that is that when the baby takes its first breath. Of course I can't. That, that, I don't know. But that's a perspective of mine. So I continued. And when that baby comes out, it's a human being. And it, is, does, it doesn't lose that separation to the love that it is. And it comes here into the world to enjoy, to be creative, to expand the universe through its creativity. And everything, you, and then you can, you know, you, I, didn't, I didn't, but all the things we're talking about here. A seven-year-old is ripe to hear these things, I believe. Uh, but that was, you know, the how a baby is born. <laughs> Yeah, wait till they discover. <laughs> anyway. I think it's also important for a child to understand that they're not separate from the universe. They are not separate from, if you use the terminology God, they are not separate from God. They are not separate from all there is. That the entirety of all that is would not be what it is without them. It can't be. How could it be? <laughs> all there is means just that but letting a child know that there is nothing to fear you have to know that first or else your delivery of it will be lip service is it possible for you to reach that dimension within yourself where you can see the illusion of what fear is. The reality that fear is a man-made concept brought on by the evolution of consciousness. It's part fear, the ego is part of that and it's breaking away. And that in reality, in an infinite universe, how can fear exist? What, are you, what could you possibly be afraid of? There is nothing, you know? Uh, of course, the greatest fear that we suffer is the fear of death. Maybe that's for another episode. I was actually thinking I might get to that in this one, but we're almost at the two hour mark. <laughs> uh, but for you to be able to teach, one of the most vital things that a child can understand, uh, uh, the most vital thing a child can know is that they are not separate from all that is and that not only is there nothing to fear but that all is well actually all all is well all is much better than well in the universe well the, the, the well-being is the foundation of the universe <laughs> joy freedom expansion infinite expansion you can you can even tell them that they are the universe, which they are, and so are you. We all are. And how do they know that? How can they, how can they prove that? The foundation of the universe is infinite freedom. 
infinite abstract freedom. There's no limitations to the freedom of all there is, to the infinite realm of potentiality. Even scientists can tell you this. They, they, at least those may be studying um, quantum physics. <laughs> but even in science circles, the word quantum physics is not accepted in many. It's like it's like a dirty word in some scientific circles. It's weird. That's at least what I experienced at Starmus. <laughs> uh, but in any event, it's the closest thing that I can recognize, and I'm not an authority on any of it, to where the spirituality and science may merge. Uh, but in the teaching of the foundation of the universe is infinite freedom, the, the action of the universe is expansion, and the reason is joy. This is Abraham Hicks now. Um, you can feel that in yourself. You can, uh, if, you, if you understand that within you you're, is the capability of being infinitely free, and the way that you can see this in yourself is to ask yourself, are there any limitations on the kinds of thoughts that I can think, on the kinds of creative thoughts, on, on any thought? To, is, is there, are there, is there a, a limitation? No. No, there's not. There's no limitations in your ability to be imaginative. It's infinite. And when you do it, you are creating it. You are expanding. The, the, everything you do exp adds to the universe. It, you, you are, in, in essence, a creator. And your creations manifest through you from your foundation, which is infinite freedom of thought. So when you have access to the infinite freedom of, right now it seems limited because it's obstructed by fear. Matter of fact, the infinitude of our own potential is the thing we fear. <laughs> and, uh, but you can at least, at least on an intellectual level understand that there is no limitations to your ability to think anything you want. There is nobody in your head saying, no, you can't think that. There's no police. There's, you, could be, you, could be, you could be in a prison camp suffering and dying, and still nobody can touch your thoughts. It's an extreme example, but there is wisdom in it. And also, the action of the universe is expansion. That's what you do. That's what you do every day through your creativity. You are, you came from the universe and you're doing the work of the universe, God, whatever, by being creative. That's what you're here for in a joyous way. Because when you, now you have to kind of try to go there in your mind when you are being, when you are exercising your infinite creativity and expanding the universe with it, whether you're making dinner or you're building a castle, it doesn't matter. You're still, the universe doesn't care. It doesn't weigh these things in. It doesn't say you're more important because you did that and you did that because everything's connected. Uh, uh, then you are, that's, that, that feeling that you get is joy. That's the feeling, infinite joy, infinite love in your creative expansion. <laughs> so that's your birthright. You are worthy of it. That's what you're here for. And the more fear you clear out of your life, the more powerful and effective your creations will be. And not on the level, uh, do not mean on the level of what, how, you're, how they may look to you that they change the world. Because you have no idea of knowing how the simple little thing that's natural to you, that you love doing, that you give your attention to, that you put quality into, how that affects the world. You don't know. You'll never know. Um, 
your inner your higher being your inner being knows and that is your function and um and you can feel infinite creativity in it and you can feel expansion in it and when you are feeling those two things you are reflecting your source your creator the universe itself because the state of love and joy infinite love and joy is the result of your infinite creative expansion <laughs> god where does this stuff come from <laughs> anyway all right well i've been going for a while and i'm going to i'm going to stop there is one more thing i'd like to add i have had a lot of questions i'd love to get to these questions thank you so much for sending them by the way uh we opened up a little private email under it all at vi.com for those who have more personal questions uh we did this a while ago and and there's some uh, it's my email box is very full uh and i do hope to get to all of them maybe not live i might type uh but i i have to at this time go off the grid i've really enjoyed doing these live streams the alien guitar secrets and the under it all uh but i do need to stop for a while because there's a project i want to do for you and i'll be back of course there's a lot a lot that i feel i feel more comfortable now discussing because of your responses um in the beginning i i never it was i was uh, like at 50% even 55% feeling as though i'm not ready i'm i'm not ready to talk about these things in this l kind of level uh and that in and of itself was my ego um because there was a fear attached to talking about these things because they're very lofty principles and they can give one the impression that they are holier than thou and that's not my intention um i had fear of offending but then um I had some one friend that I spoke to about it and also my wife who said you should do it because you've been practicing on me for 40 years. <laughs> She calls it bedtime stories. Where at night when we go to bed I go I just blah, 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 blah. and she says you can make it much easier by just telling and this is Pia. She's so brilliant and she's so funny. <laughs> She says you can make it all much easier by just telling them you get a deck of cards, you play them, the end. <laughs> so that's real wisdom. <laughs> anyway, uh before I sign off, I'm going to go on for uh, I'm going to go overtime and this might take a while. So, if you're bored or if you're still expecting me to play the guitar or talk about bending notes or something like that, uh we have probably 13 hours of Alien Guitar Secrets live on uh, YouTube and also these under it all sessions are on YouTube. There's I haven't put the last one up yet because I'm still debating on whether I want to include that story I told. <laughs> But it'll come out in some form. Uh But I feel really compelled to express this one point. And it's called and we are one. Give me a moment. When a person looks into the world through the eyes of fear, even slight fear, um they are looking through um the conditioned ego. I talk about this all the time. Through that perspective, all the things you see will look separate and you will feel alone and you will feel by yourself. And you will be trying to find your sense of security in things in the world and that will never work because everything in the world comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes 
and comes and goes and comes and goes. <laughs> Everything. But there is something in you that does not come and go. And it has never changed. And we've discussed this before. It's who you really are. And the eliminating of the noise of the mind will start to give clarity on truth and reality that is who you are and is in the world. And you start to see the world differently. One of the profound things that you start to see in the world that is not the normal perspective is the normal diseased perspective <laughs> is that there is nothing that you can do or accomplish that doesn't require everybody else. We are all actually in reality working together as a team, everybody on a deeper level below the level of it looking as though you're paying for things and you have to acquire things in order to have them and you have to um, uh, figure things out and you have to uh, get the best deal you can, you know? I'm, I'm going deeper than that. I'm removing all that and just looking at what's actually happening. If you look into the world, you realize what's actually happening is we are all supporting each other in ways that are phenomenal in ways that without each other, nothing would ever happen, nothing ever would have happened, and nothing would have ever gotten done, there would be nothing. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm looking at you right now. Uh, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at a camera. Uh, that camera makes this event possible, that's one of the things. That camera, okay, let me, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. There is a function that you have in life, and if, let's say, hypothetically, that function was that thing I was pointing out before that is your real point of joy, your point of enthusiasm, your point of creativity, your point of no fear, your point of no future, no past, your joyous unfolding of whatever that little thing is, it could be anything, you could be the guy that made this lens just the lens, not any of the other components in the camera. That could be your function, and if that is a joyous function for you, you have lenses and you've studied them and it's, they're interesting to you, and you t take pride in the lenses you make, and when, a, and when a guy like me buys that lens, I am helping you to fulfill your function. The, I'm helping the guy who made the lens to fulfill his function, and he's helping me to fulfill my function by having a lens to be able to talk to you through. Now this is happening with every single thing around you in a level that you can't even trace. The house you live in, the nails that hold it together. I mean, the nails that hold your house, somebody makes nails. Somebody delivers those nails. Somebody, can you see the, the depth that you'd have to unravel and dissect? to see the contribution of everybody in anything you do. That nothing can happen without the contribution of it. There'd be no uh, the nails to hold the studio together. And you might say, well, well, I would just get somebody else to sell me nails. No, I'm talking about nails, the guy that makes nails, not the guy, but the whole concept, you know? It's there and people are engaging in it. And the, it, it, that holds true for everything, everything in your house. You, everything you do cannot, it, it requires the function of others. And the quality, you are fulfilling everybody else's function when you are enjoying and using their creative manifestations. So, and, and here's the thing, the universe doesn't weigh in Who's more valuable? <laughs> it might, I mean, a person might see someone like Jimi Hendrix and say, nope, he was the best. He was the most valuable. He was the one that opened it up for everybody. And on one level, yes, it looks that way. There were certain things that Jimi Hendrix introduced that opened up the floodgates for all sorts of things. But there was no way that he could have done that, his function, his particular function, 
if not for the contribution of everybody else. There is, they, he is no more important than the guy that made the wood for his guitar, you know, the, or anything else. On the human level, through the perspective of the ego, oh no, what are you talking about? No, no, Einstein was more important than whatever, you know, that guy is much more important than me. His contribution to the world was fantastic. You know, I, my contribution, I don't have a, con my contribution is useless. I will never be contributed. I don't know what I'm here for. Nothing I do is ever good enough. Uh, why do I do it? I don't even know what to do. And, it, and, and how do I, why do I keep failing? Why am, I, why am I failing at all of these grandioso fantasies that I have? The reason you're failing is because they're not the right things for you. They're egoic fantasies. And if you had them, you would be more miserable than you could imagine. <laughs> you don't believe that from where you're at. But your real joy, your real joy in life exists in your function, in your joyful function. And it requires, and to find that, it requires you to remove the idea that you need to be an, a contributor of something historical in order to be of any value. You, you, you need to not base the value of you on what the world bases value on. If you do, you're just in trouble. You're going to suffer, and you'll never feel good about yourself. You need to know that you are what you are. It's happening and you don't even know it because you're looking through the eyes of fear, even at the things that you do, questioning that all the fear that you feel, all the all those questions. Why does nothing ever work for me? Why, why don't these people take me seriously? Why does my contribution is never going to be big enough? This is all seen through the eyes of fear. It's an illusion. It's not really, really happening except in your mind. But because it's happening in your mind, you see it in the world. <laughs> if you can see that that's what you're doing, that's the beginning of the releasing of yourself from it. And it's the beginning of your ability to recognize your true function, your joyful function, and to understand that by giving your function, whatever it is, whatever you are doing right now, that job that you hate even, it, give it your full attention, give it your when you give it your full attention, you are giving it your appreciation and your, there's a quality in what you do. The quality of that nail that you make or whatever it is, the eraser, <laughs> it's joined at the hips of the quality of the intention behind it. So when you contribute to the world, whatever it is that your quality uh, is high in, you are a powerful contributor to all that is in ways that are reflective of the reason why you came here. And it requires everybody else. When you, when, can you imagine, just imagine, what it would be like to look through a fearless lens into the world with no fear and to actually see the truth of that one thing, that we are actually all working together. That eliminates borders, it eliminates race, race, it eliminates sex, male, female, it eliminates religions, it eliminates, poli it eliminates politics, it eliminates all those things that we have a tendency to create through our fearful perspectives. And you can look behind those, you can, you can open them up and see that actually we are one and we are all working together in a joyous way and the moment that we start and that is the new that is the evolution of consciousness in, in man when they discover that where would be the need for money when you appreciate what you do the little thing that you do and the person that is receiving it is appreciating your contribution you know what it feels like when your contribution is appreciated. That's built in. 
that feels good and and when you see that this is what's happening around you you have a different perspective perspective of your fellow man when you can appreciate your fellow man that's love that's real love that has no agenda in it you, there's no way to understand what this is seen through the eyes of fear they're opposite in every way but you'll never be able to escape the fact that you one day will be there you will know it if you don't already some people do uh, maybe not this life I don't know but that's the destiny of humanity and when that happens I don't know if we'll we may like I say I don't know if we have to destroy ourselves or most of us to get there hopefully not I don't know but when we get there it will, it will be a different world now some might say oh you're an idealist oh that's a utopian mentality yup and I wear that badge proudly I am a full core idealist and I wear that badge proudly and if more people were like that you'd have less problems in the world because I know that's where we're heading and that's what heads us there imagining it that's how it happens you imagine it and then the sheer imagining of it has an attraction to it if you're not completely unconscious in your fear and then you start to see it in your world and and Eckhart Tolle calls it a new earth and uh, it's happening and some people are living in it right now because that's their perspective they are not attracting fear in their life so that's your responsibility and that's your purpose well I think I mentioned your purpose was whatever you were doing in in your now but that walks hand in hand with enjoying your function but your ultimate function in the world is to forgive it and that's something that also ha based on my explanation if you're just joining this please go back and check out what I was saying about that maybe it'll be helpful Forgiving the world reveals the, the real world to you. In Christian terminology, I would say that's called heaven. And as Jesus stated, it's around you at all times, and it's in you. But you have to remove the pole to see it. And that's what it also means, I believe, to be reborn to you're being born out of the dreams of negative thinking of false lies ignorance fear rising above fear is being reborn and it's your destiny uh, and a ceremony will not do it nor a, a ritual it's something that just it comes when you decide that that's what you really want <sighs> thank you I'm done now one, one other thing I know that uh, there's still a lot going on in the world in regard to lockdown. I hope that you're finding uh, some solace in it and some creativity in it and some good things. I know that there's uh, very many challenging and painful things going on as a result of this virus. But I'm not judging it because I have no idea what it means. I have no idea of knowing how it's going to change the world but I know that it has its place somehow. 
Um, perhaps one of the ways it'll change the world is, uh, I think, you know, the, the social distancing, uh, if it doesn't turn into paranoia, uh, it can be helpful because people will maybe be a little more conscientious of how clean they are, how much they're touching their whatever these things are. Maybe we won't be shaking hands. I love shaking hands. Uh, but, uh, well, except when I have a big line of people. I, I don't like doing that because at the end of shaking 200 hands, my hand feels like I dipped it in battery acid. <laughs> and every time I shake your hand, you're shaking hands with all these other people. So I, I do it because I know it's meaningful to some people. But I, I, I like hugging. I'm a, I'm a big hugger. This is something I might also mention in regard to how to teach your children uh, or, how, you know, some of the ways. In our family, we're big huggers. Like when I, when I hug my sons or my wife, it's not flippant. It's not, I'm not sure if sometimes it's a quick one, but there is a focus in it. There is a real focus. I feel, I, I, we hold it for a long time. And I feel them. I, I, I mer we merge with each other in appreciation and love. And that's a beautiful way to hug. And when I hug some of you, that's what I feel too. Unless it's a quickie, you know. But perhaps we will be doing away with some of those things in the future. So I have a suggestion that maybe we can try. Some of the fans that, you know, the folks that are going to be visiting me in, in the future in the various Evo experiences or whatever we end up doing, and that's this connection. It's the connection of still, present, appreciation. It's that connection when the eyes just lock and you, you're not looking at the person. You're not looking at Steve Vai or Steve Vai. You know, you're looking at the awareness that's there. And when you do that, it's the same as yours. That's what you, you can recognize. It's much deeper than an autograph. Autographs, what do you do with an autograph, really? Come on, what do you really do? You're, oh, I got this autograph, and then you put it away, and then your kids are going to throw it away someday. Or you might sell it. I don't know. But and it, autographs have their place. Photos, you know, how much deeper is that connection that I can have with you when I see you than a photograph. A photograph is dead. <laughs> what we can get from, what you can receive from another person by giving them that attention is something you can remember and have with you for the rest of your life and you don't need a photo. And it's deep. So what I might suggest if I meet you I see you. That's it. That's enough. That's deep. And I like that. Uh, so maybe we can try that. Trust me, it beats shaking hands. <laughs> you rock. I appreciate you. I don't know when I'll see you again here, but I'm looking forward to it. Keep posted. Oh, one more thing. We got those donations you can make. They go to my charity. They're in the stars. And, uh, okay. Thanks.